Welcome to the Life Bulb webinar focused on the microbiome and how the microbiome affects your body entirely. It's not just the gut. So uh, my name is Karin Heenberger. I'm the CEO of Life Bulb, and I'm joined here today by uh, two ladies from Genetic Analysis. And I'm really privileged to be, be sitting with, with both of you. Um, it, it's really nice to be back with uh, Kari Furu because uh, you were one of the finalists of our innovation challenge that we ran a few weeks ago with uh, Bristol Myers Squibb in Princeton. And you were an incredibly uh, strong contender. Um, and uh, today also joined by Christina Cassian, uh, who is uh, a scientific um, officer here of uh, genetic analysis. And both of you truly scientific. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a strong team of um, uh, strong women. And so, um, you know, I want to I wanna start out really by, you know, asking a little bit about what is genetic analysis um, and briefly, but then I want to dig in to the microbiome. You know, most of us have heard about the microbiome in the context of uh, yogurt, in the context of... Uh, uh, you know, how do you feel better in your gut? Um, is it different in different people? And, and how does it affect the rest of the body? But what do we truly know about the microbiome? Um, you know, I think it's, it's been, uh, it's, it's a little dangerous to say that we can take a pill and it's going to be all fine. Uh, because if we don't know what the variations are between individuals, what is normal and what is abnormal, then how do we actually make sure that the microbiome is healthy? So uh, welcome, Corey. I'm gonna start by asking you just briefly, what is genetic analysis? And then I'm actually gonna go to Christina to say, what is the microbiome? Thank you, Karin, and, and thank you so much for, uh, for having us here today and letting us talk about our favorite topic, the microbiome. Uh, the microbiome is really a passion uh, of, uh, of mine and also for all of us working at the genetic analysis. So thank you so much for having us. So genetic analysis is uh, a, a Norwegian company. So we're based in Oslo, Norway. We have a focus on the uh, gut microbiome and gastrointestinal diseases. So we were founded back in 2008. So we've been around for quite a while. Uh, we have um, a specific technology that I would like to talk more about as we uh, uh, go along in this webinar, but we call that our technology, the DA map technology. And what we use that for is to look at the uh, gut microbiome and analyze the bacteria present in the microbiome. Um, and we have, as I said, a focus on gastrointestinal diseases. We have a lot of focus on IBS and IBD, working with uh, researchers and doctors worldwide uh, who are using our technology and our product in their work. We have a product on the market called the DA map dysbiosis test which is used to characterize dysbiosis in, in patients. And what that means is that we look at the gut microbiome profile and uh, say whether a patient is normal biotic or dysbiotic. And that is our uh, core focus. And I will stop there because I know that we will be, get the chance to talk more about this uh, uh, during the webinar. But um, again, thank you so much for having us here. We are super excited about this session. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was, uh, that was great. We, we now understand a little bit more about genetic analysis. So, so Christina, what, what is the microbiome? How do you define that? Yeah, uh, talking about the microbiome, you actually talk about all the microorganisms we have in or on our uh, body. And uh, it's uh, a combination of fungi, bacteria, viruses uh, that exist in, let's say, a particular environment in your body or on your body. For example, the skin or the gastrointestinal tract. That is a microbiome. Uh, <clears throat> and you have different representatives from these microorganisms depending on which area of the body you are talking about. 
And today, I think we, in this webinar, we will concentrate on the gut microbiome uh, and the particular bacteria that is found in this environment. And uh, <clears throat> each human individual, they have, has about 220 approximately different bacteria in their gut. Uh, the total number you may, you know, select from is more than a thousand, but each individual, uh, you know, ha has more or less around this number. So, so it's a huge different sorry. bugs. So mm -hmm. 250 different bugs in our guts. Is that what yes. you Yes, right. And, and, but how many each of those bugs? Because I realized that there are quite a few of them in the gut. It is. Uh, we are talking trillions in total of bugs. Uh, and uh, the thing is that when we, when we use, you know, the expression, your microbiota profile, we, we, we don't measure all the 220 because that's far too much. We try to concentrate on the most important bacteria, those that really tells us something about your condition or your status, your health status. And uh, that is down to a, a number of maybe between 30, 40, 50, up to 100 sometimes, depending on what you are looking for. Uh, I also usually say that we have all humans, independent of where you live or where you come from, you have a type of core bacteria, mm -hmm. the most important bacteria that all individuals need to have a functional body, a body that actually is living. So the, the, the bacteria, they help you uh, representing many functions in your body that you wouldn't have without them. That's important to remember. So these bacteria uh, that normally when we think about bacteria, we think about harm, right? Yeah. To harm. But these bacteria live with us in so-called symbiosis. Yes. We, we, many of, of the bacteria are extremely beneficial to us. Mm -hmm. They provide essential, essential functions for our health, uh, like they are producing uh, vitamins, butyrate, you know, um, metabolize that's needed for us to have a functioning body, more or less. And those are usually very harmless bacteria. However, to your question, you know, we also have what we call opportunistic bacteria. And those in a healthy status in, in the gut, they are in a very, very low number. But sometimes if something is happening, you know, they might start to uh, increase in the abundance and then they could end up uh, as a, a play a harmful role for you. Um, and One example of that is of a patient who is living with inflammatory bowel disease or a patient who's living with an organ transplant or a patient who's living with multiple sclerosis um, or psoriasis when they are on immune suppressant drugs. Uh, would that in any way uh, change the distribution or the number of harmful bacteria in the microbiome in the gut? Uh, well, I don't know about all types of um, medication. There are some very typical examples, which is antibiotics, because that works directly on the bacteria. Mm -hmm. uh, these other um, treatment you, you do, for example, in IBD, shows more an indirect uh, behavior towards the bacteria. Uh, but it is also shown that during treatment with, for example, biologics, uh, an IBD patient may change uh, he or his, uh, her microbiota. That's, that's absolutely possible. So it has an impact. Um, Let's use the antibiotic example, because I think that most individuals are familiar with uh, antibiotics. And, and, and also, I think most people have heard that when you're on an antibiotic, you should eat yogurt. You know, is there any truth to that? Well, yes, uh, it's a little bit true to that. However, I think maybe yogurt is maybe not strong enough to have an impact on changing because uh, the antibiotics is a strong, strong medication, while uh, yogurt is 
kind of a mild type, I would say. So if you really want to keep up with a good microbiota during an antibiotics, you, you should use something stronger like probiotics or uh, prebiotics maybe to keep, you know, the good bacteria living. So let's talk about those probiotics and prebiotics. There are a variation of them on the market. And uh, I hear some doctors say, well, they're just dead bacteria because they can't, if you're giving them in a pill, uh, you know, they're not, they're not really going to be helpful. So how do we know that we're getting the right medication uh, to help our microbiome? Yeah, th that's not so, you know, easy to know because if you really should, will know, you have to measure, you know, how these probiotics or prebiotics actually change your microbiota. Well, and then you have to carry, right? That goes back to your point with genetic analysis, because if you as a company can set up a way to analyze the microbiome on a regular basis, then there may be a way to actually assess the uh, medications or the so-called supplements that some um, doctors or alternative doctors uh, are, are prescribing. Absolutely true. Uh, we have actually uh, worked together with uh, some researchers and, and done some studies on this. And uh, you're absolutely right, Karin. Uh, there are quite a variety of products available. Not all of them uh, are, are probably are very efficient because they will be broken down by the acid in our stomachs. However, there are some formulas that uh, prevent breakdown in the stomach and can release live bacteria in, um, in the small and large intestine. And these will probably have a much more beneficial effect going down uh, the line. But it is important to think about who you listen to and who you work with when, if you are as a patient in, in this situation, when you find yourself in a situation where you would like to have some help with your gastrointestinal uh, uh, problems, you need to be a little bit critical because as uh, Karin pointed out, there are uh, quite a lot of players out there and not all of them are equally serious. So uh, do take the information available with a grain of salt, do some background research. And if people are trying to uh, you know, sell you something that uh, seems too good to be true, it, it might actually be too good to be true. Uh, so uh, the same is uh, true for all aspects in life, e including for, for the microbiota, unfortunately. But um, yes, yeah, so going back to um, profiling uh, of the microbiota, I think that we have seen in the past, you know, that um, people have been on really high doses of probiotics and you can see that they get very, very high levels of lactobacillus uh, in their samples, for instance. That is something that we have seen um, that may not be uh, super beneficial to have extremely high levels of uh, this one type of bacteria. So that also uh, comes back to the large complexity of the microbiome, because it's not just a matter of one or a few types of bacteria. Like Christina uh, mentioned, it is a wide range of different species that live together and colonize and thrive in our gut. And for you to have um, a good, well-functioning gastrointestinal system that also, of course, works together with other parts of your body, you need to have a good balance. So it's about diversity in the gut microbiome and the, gut, and the diversity of the gut microbiome comes from a good and balanced lifestyle diet and overall wellness. So it's, um, it, I think it is uh, trying to boil it down to as simple as taking a, uh, a single pill or a simple supplement that is probably not going to do wonders to an imbalanced gut. So going back, going to that point, which is, which is truly interesting because the gut influences so much and we, we, we will talk about that next, but <coughs> If you're saying that a well-balanced diet, exercise, and wellness in general, maybe also mental health, 
you know, affect the distribution of the bacteria in your gut. Uh, have there been studies? I, I seem to remember that there may have been uh, studies looking at um, individuals who live in, say, for example, New York City versus those who live in the Amazon. Uh, you, you know, uh, those those individuals who live in a indigenous society versus those who live in a big city. You know, are, are there changes in the microbiome that um, reflect uh, those different lifestyles? This has been fairly well studied. Um, and uh, you are absolutely right. When you look at uh, people who live such different types of lives, such as, you know, New York City versus Amazon, yes, we do absolutely see differences in uh, the gut microbiota composition. However, people have been very, very um, almost convinced that there are such a large variation in the microbiome composition in terms of geographical ver um, regions that you cannot compare one population to the next. At genetic analysis, we have done uh, quite a lot of studies on this as well. Um, we have focused on uh, healthy, normal individuals so that you get as a clean and um, good population to uh, study as possible. And when you do look at, like uh, Christina mentioned before, the core commensal bacteria in uh, in these uh, healthy individuals, the variation is not as large as you might think, but the exception is these rural communities such as around the Amazon and also parts of Africa, where you do see um, quite a lot of differences compared to Western industrialized um, communities. That's, that's a very important point, because I think that when those studies came out, um, uh, there was a belief that you would be able to say, oh, a person who's living a healthy life in New York City versus someone who is not living so healthy would also have very different microbiome. But it's really not. What Christina was saying initially was that most of us have a distribution of, say, 30 bacteria, and, uh, and they're pretty much, much equal, even if we live in a similar set up meaning in a in a in in, in a developed country yes uh, that's very very important to to realize uh the other i think myth that i'd love to get debunked or or uh you know validated is this idea that the bacteria in our gut are driving behavior such as um appetite i've heard that there are certain bacteria that like chocolate and there are people who are more of a chocoholic and they are driven by their bacteria. And that is their defense when they are eating many Snickers bars. So is, is, is there something to this? Well, in, in, in a way, it is something to it, absolutely. Uh, because um, depend on what you're eating, uh, actually you will have more or less uh, abundance of different bacteria because the food you are in a way giving your bacteria will actually make them colonize more uh, if it's their favorite food because these bacteria they live on very different food that, that's very important to understand so what you are eating when you eat something you actually uh, feed those bacteria who enjoy that type of food most mm -hmm. so if you start to eat more chocolate well then you have will have an increase in bacteria that actually like chocolate and then you are, you know, kind of in a circle because they scream for more if, if they are hungry again. So that, that's the way it goes. So I, I don't know if you ever try to, to be on a diet to, to lose weight, but you know that the first couple of days you are really, what you say in English, you really hunger for sugar. Yeah. After a couple of days, it moves away because then those bacteria who are actually actually sugar eaters, you know, they are reduced in abundance. So that, that's the mechanism here. 
It's that's why people say you got to sustain a diet for a certain period of time because that yeah. will change the distribution of the bacteria. Yes. And personally, I think that's such a good argument for for switching a diet. You know, because if you think about it, it's not the loss of um, your own you know behavior or change of your own behavior. It's really the bugs. So you can blame the bugs for for these kind of things and and it makes it almost easier for the person, <laughs> uh, you know, um, yeah. to, to, to do so. Um, interesting. Uh, if we go back to our, our, you know, focus, which is healthcare and it, individuals who have some sort of disease, you know, and we talked about behavior, is there also a link between mental health and depression? Uh, have you seen any studies or are you involved in any, any studies there that food in itself triggering changes in the bacterial composition of the microbiome can improve or worsen uh, mental health. Yeah, well, I, can, I can quickly comment. Yeah. Uh, we haven't really uh, done much on this as a company, but there is a lot of very, very interesting um, uh, research going on in this field. And there is most definitely a link between our gut microbiome and our brain. We call this the gut-brain axis. And what we see and what we now know is that there is a certain link between our gut microbiome and mental uh, disorders such as anxiety. And I, I think that this is really, really important and really helpful in the sense that um, people have been told that to, you know, uh, just get a grip and, and, and just try to get their life back into shape. Uh, whereas in, in reality, there is a physical mechanism involved here. So it's not a matter of just trying to pull yourself together. Now, there is a physical link between your brain and your gut. And when one works, the other will be affected. And there's, a, of course, uh, we don't know always what, what is the cause and what is the effect, but that there is a link we now know for certain. We have shown it physically in animal uh, models and we also see it in, uh, in populations, uh, population studies. And um, this is also why there is a large uh, increase in the risk of um, certain mental disorders in, in patients with gastrointestinal disorders. And it is not just because of you know, the, um, the crippling effects and, and the lowered quality of life due to the gastrointestinal problems, but also because of the physical link between the gut and the brain. Truly interesting, um, because that those things are, of course, also um, affecting each other. So, so, uh, but having having that in mind. So, if we, if we try now with our the, kind of the final few minutes here, really to think about how genetic analysis can make an impact. You know, there, there's truly a, a big role for the microbiome uh, in the future when it comes to healthcare and when it comes to wellness. You know, we, we already have a lot of companies out there trying to position their, um, their probiotics as the solution to antibiotic resistance or a stomach ache or, you know, and any, any real malaise. Uh, and and, and what, what you're saying is we need to analyze the microbiome. So, when you analyze the microbiome, do you need to take a biopsy from the intestine or do you, is it enough with a fecal sample? It is definitely enough with a fecal sample. So uh, our technology provides a non-invasive uh, tool to look at the microbiome composition. So you can simply take a fecal sample in the comfort of your own home and get that analyzed. And that can give you some important clues uh, in collaboration with your doctor, uh, what is going on in your gut. And the um, uh, product that we currently have on the market, the GMF dysbiosis test, 
uh, as I mentioned before, uh, will uh, give you an indication of whether your gut microbiome is imbalanced, and that is, that is what we call in dysbiosis, um, yep. which means that you have either too little of the good bacteria or an and or an overgrowth of the bad bacteria. And that is what this imbalance is what we call dysbiosis. And what we have done is that we have uh, uh, <coughs> made it. What is important to remember is that to to understand what dysbiosis is, we you first need to understand what what normal microbiota is or uh, normal biosis. So we have defined normal biosis by uh, collecting a lot of different samples from healthy, normal individuals. And not just from Norwegians. Absolutely not. <laughs> we have uh, uh, collected healthy, normal cohorts from around the globe, uh, all over Europe. We have also uh, included um, Canada and the US. We are currently uh, doing it in China. Um, and of course, we're uh, ever aiming to increase this, uh, this population. Um, but this means that you can be sure that you can measure your microbiome to a relevant reference range. So it's not just a random number. It is actually the, the, so say, uh, so in relation I, to what's yeah, normal. So, so say that I do this test and um, uh, it shows up that I need, I, I don't have enough of one of the 30. Um, it, how, do I, how do I get access to those specific bugs? And how do I know that they're going to populate my, my microbiome, my, my gut, uh, and not just die out because I'm eating too much chocolate? I don't know, Christina, would you like to answer that? Yeah, question? I, I think when you when you do the test, you will get a report form back where you actually can read all the details from what your microbiota looks like, mm -hmm. which is quite interesting. And in this report form, you can you can read whether you are above or below uh, uh, in some of, of your uh, compared to healthy, uh, mm -hmm. if you are uh, below or above in some or more of these bacteria. And dependent a bit on which bacteria we're talking about, we know the functionality of that bacteria and we know maybe what we could do to change this balance mm -hmm. back to a normal balance. That's possible in some cases. I'm not but saying- that, that is truly all... important because yeah. you're doing a test where there is no intervention. Uh, right. I mean, there's a certain value in knowing that you're not normal, mm -hmm. but most people who get some sort of answer like that would like to solve it, and 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 having a way to solve it is is critical. Um, do you partner with uh, organizations that can subsidize those bacteria, or how does that work? Well, it it works the way that usually uh, you don't you can't go and buy those bacteria you are lacking if that was your problem. Uh, you have to think broader. You have to think what type of food can I eat to increase the colonizing of those particular bacteria? What do they like to eat, those bacteria? You have to think more in that directions. So yeah. I would say that change in your diet, uh, and if it's really an odd profile you have, maybe you should go much tougher and say, fecal transplant uh, or live biotherapeutic products, which is available at least in the US now. So, you know, th there are different options for- Let's, let's step back there so that everyone understands what you just said. So fecal transplant means that you're getting um, a fecal transplant from another person and we're switching up your intestinal flora that way. Yes. Um, that is currently approved for C. diff. Uh, uh, is it also proved for dysbiosis? Well, it's uh, well the C. diff patients, you know, they have an enormous dysbiotic gut. Yeah. Uh, so they uh, more or less are able to return, not to completely normalize, but very close to, which is really nice to see that they have a, a nice functional gut after this transplant. Uh, it's not... Uh, guideline for other diseases than C. diff. 
uh, at this time point, but I know it's going to come both for IBD and IBS. I'm absolutely certain. And especially now when, you know, the first US company has actually got an FDA approval for a live biotherapeutic product, which is actually the same as microbiota transplant, but the whole thing is put into a, a capsule or, um, but it's the same type of product. It's is it orally, is it given orally or is it a um, uh, suppository? Well, it's both directions. Okay. Yeah, but but the the basic product is made from a fecal sample or you know healthy donors. Very important. So yeah. you're saying that there are two alternatives currently: the fecal transplant route or the live uh, biotherapeutic, which is essentially a fecal transplant. Yes. Capsule. I would say so. Yeah. Very cool. Mm -hmm. So, mm. so that's an important, I think, um, uh, point to to your specific company. If you can analyze and 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 if it becomes a norm that when you um, are unwell that you can get a microbiome uh, a test from genetic analysis, then that can be followed by either a referral to a dietitian um, who can put you on a, a a more appropriate diet for your microbiome that that is a good fit versus a diet that is just random, um, uh, or a fecal transplant or a live biotherapeutic. Um, so those are right now the three uh, alternatives. I know, Kari, that when you um, spoke to, uh, to us in Princeton, that there may have been also um, ideas about therapeutic items. Uh, is that something that you're thinking about in the future? And that, that's really, for me, the final question here. Uh, do you see a future for therapeutic guidance also with microbiome analysis? Yeah, I think that it's uh, it's important here to also just point out that uh, it is imp uh, you ne we need to re and remember and acknowledge that the uh, the players in this field are many, and many of them are not as uh, as uh, serious as we are. So uh, uh, I think that for for us, it has been very <laughs> important to. They not bundle our uh, pro microbiome uh, profiling product together with uh, a probiotic, for instance, because we want to be uh, focusing on what we're good at, which is the microbiome profiling part. Yeah. And, and next, it's I just want to also point out that uh, <coughs> if you would like to get a microbiota transplant, fecal transplant, live therapeutics it's very important that you don't just order one online, but do this uh, through uh, in common, together with someone who really knows what they're doing. So uh, a physician, uh, a nutritionist, uh, these people who really know uh, what they're talking about in terms of how to keep your uh, microbiota healthy and also how to possibly restore your microbiota. But back to uh, our product and the future for our product, uh, I do uh, absolutely think that um, uh, the future holds a lot of uh, interesting possibilities in terms of uh, uh, improving diagnosis and treatment options for a lot of different patient groups, including IBS and IBD starting with microbiota profiling and then getting uh, good advice on how to treat this particular patient based on um, uh, the uh, probably a combination of the, the microbiome profile and other symptoms, uh, clinical markers uh, for that particular patient. I think that that holds a great potential uh, mm -hmm. and will improve virtually millions of lives um, in, in the years to come. Beautiful. Uh, final question. Uh, how do you uh, get access to this microbiome test? Can you as an individual patient order it? Or is it, as you said, very important to work with your physician, of course. So how, how, do, you, how do you get it? In the U.S., uh, this, uh, our test can 
uh, is, is uh, sold as a service from doctor's data, which is a, uh, a lab that is located outside of Chicago. So if you look up doctor's data, you can find information on uh, microbiome testing, and they can also provide a lot of other types of testing, such as calprotectin, uh, measurements of uh, short chain fatty acid levels, so on and so forth, so that you can get a, a very good and detailed uh, picture of what is going on in your gut. Very, very valuable. Thank you. Um, Thank you both. Um, this was really interesting. I think there's so much that we have learned now about the microbiome. There's much more to learn. Um, if you want to check out genetic analysis, what is your website? You go to gamap.com or uh, geneticanalysis.com. You will find us there. And also look up us up on uh, LinkedIn. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. So please uh, uh, check us out online and um, uh, add us and follow us on uh, on LinkedIn, and we will uh, try to share as much uh, information on uh, microbiome and our work as possible. Thank you so much. And if you want to continue this conversation, you can continue it on IBD Life, or as well as Transplant Life, as well as Cancer Life. So those are the three communities that Lifebulb uh, has launched, where patients and care partners can discuss very interesting topics, such as this one, uh, with other patients. Uh, so please do check that out as well. Life always spelled with a Y. Thank you. And Christina, go and get some tea. I will. Thank <laughs> you very much. <laughs> Bye-bye now. Thank Bye. you. Bye.